and welcome to the special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Stuart Childs is joined by Aidan Lawless and Joe Patton to discuss the performance of the winter milk herd at Johnstown Castle, as well as management around calving and diet specs at housing. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're welcome to today's Let's Talk Dairy webinar. So today we're going to focus on the winter milk production side of the country. Uh, and we're going, joined by Aidan Lawless, who's the farm manager for us in Johnstown Castle in uh, County Wexford. And you're going to be, we're going to be joined from the dark by Joe's voice, Joe Patton's voice. So Joe is going to uh, talk about the winter diet uh, and Aidan is going to give us a rundown on how the farm is performing at the moment in Johnstown Castle at the minute. Um, so Joe, you're going to kick off there and we're going to bring Aidan in then and shortly to uh, give the, the update on the farm. Okay, that's grand. So, so good morning. Uh, so yeah, look, um, we, we'll base really what we're going to talk about this morning on a lot of the stuff we would be doing over the years in, in, in the Herd in Johnston Castle in, in County Wexford. So uh, look, um, I think to move on. So look, that's really what we're going to look at just quickly, maybe just to put, set the scene, Stuart, as to what's going on in Johnstown in terms of where, where the herd is at, what type of what type of stock we're dealing with. Um, then it will bring in, in on the current situation on the farm because it is a it's a, an interesting time of the year for winter milk production um, because we're in we're in that we're in that gap in the I suppose at the moment between sort of between the last of the grazing and starting into the winter diet proper. So there's a few decisions around that, particularly on closing covers and getting the getting the winter diet started. We might just highlight for a couple of minutes to what way we ran the dry cows for the last couple of years and maybe get Aidan's thoughts on that. And we'll finish out then with the with sort of the guidelines with how we are putting the winter diets together. Uh, this is for the for the milking for the fresh milking cows basically, and and what we're looking for there. Okay, so not to not to dwell on it for too long, just to give people an idea where we're at. There's a lot going on in Johnstown, and maybe the winter herd is just a part of it. But as I say, when we go further into the diets, we'll concentrate specifically on the on the winter the winter diet part. So look at basically what we're working with there in terms of the dairy unit. It's 55 hectares. Uh, part of that is you know there's an out block as well of maybe close to 20 hectares uh running about 150 cows and they're split at the moment between 60 percent autumn 40 percent spring but with different trials and all the rest of it we, we generally what we have at the moment is uh, block autumn systems and block spring systems running within the dairy unit but we'll show the figures for EBI and all are common across them all so that's really what we're, we're working with we will be talking maybe our, our autumn cows are run as, as block autumn systems at, at this stage the herd EBI is 175 which gets it up into the, the higher levels for the country growing somewhere year to year sort of 14 and a half 15 tonnes grass growth uh, on mixed soil types now I know when we any, when we have people down from from Calvin or Mon and Erlich from they laugh at us and we say mixed soil types, but believe it or not, there is a little bit of wetland in in, um, in Johnstown as well. Uh, so look, you can see on the right hand there, we're not going to go into that in too much detail. We have our winter milk systems. There's also some work going on with spring calvin cows and multi-species swords as well, uh, which is happening on some parts of the farm. And obviously, given that you know, given the the, the expertise in, in environmental research, there's a huge amount of work going on on things like nitrogen efficiency, water quality within the within the campus itself. So look, that's that's what that's what's there in the background. So we really want to just see maybe you know as we go further on, we'll see we're really specifically talking about. The, the winter portion of things there, right? So look at um, just where we're at at the moment, just to see, uh, this is across the whole herd now. So um, if you, that's just our co-op report to the end of, to basically the, to the end of August. So the 401 kilos of solids done for the year to date, averaging just short of 20.5 kilo or litres of milk to date. Uh, 438 and 369 protein is the um, is where the where the solids are at. So look at based on that, and given the fact that you know there's going to be close to two thirds of the herds freshening down and going into peak production again, we'll probably look a bit for the whole herd. That's including the the, the multi species cows, the winter herd, the whole lot. They'll average around 570 kilos of milk solids on just around a ton of concentrate. That's what the herd is doing. But within that, then in our winter system, uh, our winter herd last year. So let's say from, from 
from from September 19 to September 20. They did about 620 kilos of milk solids off 1.6 ton of concentrate, seven and a half thousand kilos of milk is roughly where where we're at. So look at that's the kind of cows we're really talking about. Um, kind of that 600 kilos of milk solids is really where we're where we're looking off off about 1.6 ton uh, of concentrate, right? So there's your calf and pattern, Stuart. Just to put it in context, and we get on to talking about feeding, we're looking for a very tight block in the autumn, uh, sort of starting in mid September, finished up, you know, pretty much finished up by by middle of November, I suppose. Uh, no carryover cows to speak of between the between the groups, and again in the spring, then a very tight uh, calf and pattern in the spring. So maybe this is relevant when we start talking about the feeding side of things, because really. You know, when, when Aidan's putting together the management for the herd in, in, in the winter period, we really are talking about managing a block of freshly calved cows in the, in the December, January period for feeding. We don't have too many stragglers or too many sort of carryover cows or lower, lower yielding um, stale cows to be dealt with. It really is a case of producing our winter milk with fresh calvers uh, because we don't have the late calvers, the April, May, June calvers to be to be filling the litres there. It is a, it is a freshly calved bunch, if, if you like. So that, that's important to remember too when it comes to deciding our diets. Um, again, look at, there's our EBI, so 175, as we said, 100 kilos of milk or thereabouts in the proof, so not um, not it's massively it's milky. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not excessive, I was just saying. Not excessively yeah. milky, no, but look at that, and the interesting thing about that, at that level of milk production, if we put these cows on sort of, sort of 600 kilos of concentrate on a on a, on, a, on a spring system, they're going to do us 490, 500 kilos of milk solids. If we put them into the winter system on one and a half ton of concentrate um, calving in September, they'll do 620 kilos of milk solids. So they're quite a, there's quite a response there to, to, the, to the production system uh, in terms of milk production, but overall the fertility uh, in spring or, or autumn would be relatively good at this stage. Now, it took time to get that right, but I think, and Aidan can come in on that in a few minutes, I think the fertility is starting to really... Uh, starting to really come true after you know probably you know there was a good seven to ten years there of trying to work at it but it's coming where we'd like it to be and look you can see on the young stock the, the profile is all about getting the EBI pushing forward so that's the type of stock we're dealing with and you know our, PD, our PDs for fat and protein are high as well so I think the reason I'm mentioning that is that when we start talking about diets, I think a lot of the time, some of the lads in winter winter production are asking, you know, what can we feed to get higher solids in the winter time? Well, breeding is going to dictate an awful lot of what your milk solids percentages are in the winter period too. So just to keep that to keep that in mind, okay. You have a very strong so at, emphasis on fertility there, Joe, as well. Actually, probably better fertility sub indexes than a lot mm -hmm. of the spring herds that we'd see. Yeah, I suppose so. But look, we, we would make the point that really, I suppose, in terms of a winter versus spring, we probably have very, very similar profile for EBI, Stuart, with probably maybe 50 kilos more milk in the proof than what than a lot of spring herds would be. That's roughly, that's it. So the idea that it has to be radically different, uh, I'd, we'd, we'd question that. Now, as I say, you know, there's when we did this, we did a trial a couple of years ago there with um, spring versus split calving versus autumn calving. There was something like 90 kilos to 100 kilos of milk solids difference between the spring and autumn systems. So that makes you wonder, like, is the production differences in, um, you know, the, the production differences are there. The, the cow is actually a quite a, a robust cow. She can work in either system, which is important, like, you know, and it's not like we have one breeding policy for the autumn herd and one breeding policy for the spring herd. We're happy that they're doing what they're supposed to do. So look at, I'll just, we'll get on to the feed now yeah. in a second, but just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with really, because it is important to put it in some context. This is as close to maybe as what our average, our average lady would be in the herd. So about average, close to the average 190 for EBI, uh, maintenance sub index or sorry milk sub index of 70 90 for fertility and our maintenance sub index of 11 so you're talking sort of 620 630 kilo cow thereabouts you can see as a, as a heifer, she'll do about 420 kilos of milk solids. And in her last, that's fifth calver now, she's doing, as a mature cow, she'll be doing 650 to 700 kilos of milk solids, right? That's the that's what our mature cows would be, bringing us back to 600 kilos in the, in the whole herd when you bring the heifers into it. So that's what you're talking about. You can see mature yields in and around that sort of seven, 
seven and a half to eight thousand um, four ninety fat three seventy protein. That's the kind of cow we're probably looking at uh, having. That we need. That's the challenge is to feed that cow over the over the winter period, right? So that's where she is. An average is seven and a half. You look at this old doll again. Nothing much to look at. Two hundred and thirty of EBI. Her production for the year. Uh, she's closer to nine and a half thousand kilos at three sixty seven four oh seven. So there is that range within the herd as well that we we have to account for a little bit too. So look at we're happy enough that. You know, those are the type of cows we're dealing with. Um, they're not massively high yield and not peak, but they do tend to have a very persistent lactation, which gives us good production for the year as a whole. So we'd expect the cows to be milking sort of 32 kilos inside and still doing 25, 26 kilos in May or June, uh, you know, having calved in the autumn. That's where a lot of the additional milk comes from is actually their performance on grass in the, in the spring. Mm -hmm. So look, that's the, you know, that's the type of herd you're dealing with. And then it's up to us then really to put the diets together to, to sort them uh, to sort them out so look at uh, maybe i'll just bring aiden in there now just yeah. maybe just to, just to see where we're at with this idea aiden of the current situation of running out of grass i suppose and maybe making the transition from from grazing into um into the winter diet and this uh, the wedge up here Aiden, is the is for the for the high high you know it's obviously for the autumn calvers at, at, a, at a reasonably high stocking rate so maybe just explain what we're looking at here yeah, so I well, I suppose the yeah the high stocking rate they're they're stocked at um, nearly four cows per hectare. So, but um, for me at this time of the year with the, the autumn calf cows, too much grass is a bigger headache than than running out of grass. If we do have to to house uh, a week earlier, right, and it's not a problem because we're not trying to milk cows off grass. Um, we, we'll be milking right throughout the winter anyway, so it's not really an issue if we house a, a, a week earlier. Um, far more beneficial if we can get out a week earlier in the spring there's there's just um the value of the grass that the, the cows will respond better to it if you offer the cows silage or grass at this time of the year they'll they'll eat the silage and leave the grass whereas in spring they'll eat the eat the grass and leave the silage so at the moment we're on the on the on the high stock and red system we're up on about 75 78 percent nearly 80 percent of them calved they're and if you ask me in a week's time, it'll probably be the same. We're just at that sort of lag period between maybe uh, replacement AI um, straws and then the, the sweeper bulls coming in. So we'll be quiet for the next week or so. And then hopefully we'll have a bit of a, a bang again that to, to finish up, like I said, towards the mid to late November. So we have um, a reasonable demand um, where there's no um, forage except grass going in at the moment, ex um, except for... The last last night before last, we brought them in around nine o'clock at night, just on off grazing, and we get offered them about a key or two of silage, just to it's probably more to keep me happy than the cows happy. But um, we want to try uh, when we start putting in a, a, a second forage into it, it's very hard to get through grass and get it cleaned out. So ideally, for that that system, we want to be have a sort of seventy five percent of our ground, I suppose, at least grazed off by the end of October, and then just clean off the last twenty five percent maybe by day and house by night, and then by be in full time, settled on our winter diet sort of mid November, at least maybe three to four weeks before we start breeding, and uh, sort of towards the fifteenth or twentieth of December. So, Aidan, um, just actually, just um, you were saying yesterday as well, I think it's interesting, and you mentioned it there as well, about the lag just between the, the AI and the sweeper bulls, but you also looked at the dates, the calving dates last, or last year. I think it might be, it's no harm to mention it because um, I suppose from for the spring herds, maybe that are, even for the winter herds and or the split herds that are going dry enough, spring calving cows now in the next couple of weeks as well, they do need to factor in what you're going to, to mention here now and when, when to dry off the cows, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. Especially, I suppose, if you're using a, a long-acting tube, and just be aware of that and all as well. I, it, it's I, Farmers are aware of it, but I suppose it just really smacked me in the face a little bit because even our own discussion group, some of them were saying, oh, you'd want, you know, you want to be giving them 10 days or anything. But I look back on all our cabins last year and all the all the cows that were in calf to Frisian, whether, it was, whether they had a Frisian bull or a Frisian heifer, on average, they calved at 274 days. So, um from 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 service so that's sort of that's on average uh ones of carrying maybe very few wouldn't carry it over 280 and some of them were back down to 270 maybe or so but yeah. a lot in cabin at that like you're the, the days are sort of working off a of gestation 283 for even like you're saying for a dry off or anything like that um 
we've sort of changed it around. Sort of, we were more going to two seventy five now this year, and sort of uh, there's a good few of them. A few of them going over then, and a few of them going under, but we seem to be more accurate at that. Like so, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that was interesting. So, in just, just just to clear that now, you, you're on. This is for your autumn. This is for your all the cows on this system are basically calved since since early September or calving since early September. The current feeding it's is, September, is though, like just our yeah. One would have well, like our our target calving day was, I think, about the twenty. But like that's where, yeah. So, there, that's on a two eighty day sort of lactation. So, we've that eighty percent or seventy five percent of calves since really, I think, the first bang of them came around the twelfth to fourteenth of September. Um, and so what we're we're coming into that five or six week period. We're not going to meet the the ninety percent calved within six weeks, but I'd probably by in, within seven or seven and a half weeks we probably will. So just that. Yeah. Yeah. But they haven't they haven't been fed any silage as such yet, the fresh calves. No, no, no. They're on so, grass yeah. and uh, at the moment they're getting, uh, well, we just upped it when the weather broke a little bit there in the last two days. I've upped to that. If they were calved over two weeks, they were on four kilos of a high UFL nut, uh, 0.95 UFL nut. Um, and at, 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 up until now, that was a 14% nut. It probably should have been a 16, but we were just finishing out the bins. So we'll be... We're actually just have to get the delivery there today now, so we're going on to the eighteen percent note now because within the next week or so we'll be we'll be in or in by anyway. So, and you're happy with the body condition because it is a question that comes up a bit, like about you know, is the autumn grasp is just as fellas might say, it's just a drink more than a feed. Uh, yeah, it, are, are they are they are they um they're not melting in terms of body condition? I think the EBI probably helps with that as well, though. But what would you think of their condition? Are you happy enough with them? No, no, we're 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 happy we're happy with the condition at the moment. But I noticed even last year, where uh, that two week period, once you go beyond the fifteenth of November, like our yeah. our stocking rate system, we have more grass and we just have to stay out grazing. Uh, we like we'll do well to get sort of sixty sixty five percent grazed on that by the end of October, and we have another thirty thirty five percent of graze because we we just don't have the the same demand, um, and we have more grass to, to graze. So. On that system, I thought we lost a little bit of condition, maybe more so just in that sort of 15 to sort of the middle, mid to late November when we were still grazing, even though only like, yeah. yeah um, and they were still, they were well fed, but just, uh, yeah, like like I said, the mm. cows prefer. So, that, so that's this year, like, I mean, that's what Aiden has been doing the last years is not allowing the cover build too heavy on that system in the autumn and be able to, because they're all calved in the autumn, be able to get spin out the last round to be sort of in by early November and then feed them well for the winter period and be ready to go in the spring. So really, yeah, I, in a way, like the key, yeah. Yeah, go on, John. Yeah, yeah, all right. yeah, so the key almost to, to making sure your body condition on your cows is good in the autumn is making sure that you manage your covers correctly in August, that you don't yeah. let the farm build too heavy. Do you know what I mean? So it's all yeah. linked together in a way. Sorry. And, in, and then transitioning as well to, to actually have them in and settled on the diet before you do start yeah. breeding is, is important too. And once the once I they're did. in, feed them damn well. Like, yeah. Sorry, Aiden. Yeah, sorry. No, Go ahead, ideally, our, yeah, right. I, ideally our our sort of peak cover, like, so we we don't want to be grazing anything much over eighteen hundred at any. Stage. Now, sometimes it will happen, but like, generally, and probably you you would have said Joe as well. It's sort of nearly the, it's the cost of the autumn system is that we're not getting great as good value as we should really out of our. August, September grass that sort of we end up cutting silage sort of generally towards the end of August or even first week of September to correct the to correct the wedge and um and bring down that sort of we're taking out lovely grass if you like really and bailing it but um rather than that just if we if we ended up grazing that we just we we wouldn't get through our because our our demand is only really kicking in from late September on we just wouldn't get through our 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 grazing ground in October that we want to so yeah yeah. Yeah. What's the objective in terms of closing cover then, Aidan? Uh, Is it the, the same? main ob objective, I would have said to Joe yesterday, once the 1st of October comes, we don't graze that ground again. So the closing cover sort of will look after itself then. So generally what will happen, it's probably generally around maybe 600 or so, but it's it's what will generally happen is we're grazing lower covers in the last round. So the grass, the recovery tends to be a lot better and it's we've we've no white butter and so we, we've we've a green cover so anything that's even grazed in the last five or six days or ten days is is jumping out of the ground again because it was really only a cover of sort of sixteen, eighteen hundred it was grazed and we have a shorter period so we, we don't we have very little even our last thirty percent is still grazed um in the last ten days of or the first ten days of November. 
So we have a tighter, shorter wedge and we have a bigger block of, we wouldn't have the sort of a higher higher block of grass then coming into the spring, ideally, hopefully, anyway. So that's just, we, we, we generally get grow a good bit of grass from when we close from the first, so anything that's grazed from the first of October on is now, isn't, isn't grazed again. And the odd occasion, if the weather breaks, right, and we could have a paddock that might have a heavy enough cover on it that was grazed towards the late, late September and yeah, if, it's still, leave it down. if it's too messy, we'll get a lot better value out of that by grazing. We could go out and sweep the hove at any time in January if the weather was, was good and the cows would love it rather than fighting with it in the autumn. Okay. Mm. Will we move on, short. Do you yeah. happy enough? It's yeah. the it's the um it's so it's really peak cover in the autumn is the key message there. Don't let the and farm go out of hand. Yeah, and just to emphasize again, so you're hoping to close around the six hundred mark so mm. and, and your opening cover then is kinda you're still aiming to get up around that maybe nine hundred of an yeah. of an opening cover back yeah, to yeah. Kind of spring principles again then. Like, it, our biggest priority is sort of we close from the first of October and if some years you'll get better growth than others, but like even if it's if, if, if we're ahead of ourselves, we're not worried because we, we won't have a problem with sort of too heavy covers in the spring. That won't never be a problem with us. Because yeah, because we, you've significant demand straight away, like and they're mid lactation cows too. Yeah. Their, their intakes are up at twenty kilos. So they're not yeah. like a not like a freshly calf cow going to grass. They'll actually mow out whatever's in front of them, they'll take it with them in the in the spring. Look at yeah, we'll just move on, maybe on just before yeah, sorry, you go sure, on, okay. Joe, there's a, a question for Aiden there. What's the average yield and milk composition at the moment, Aiden? Uh, at the moment it, they're really just jumping up and down, but on that autumn herd at the moment they're um they're about uh, twenty five litres and at four 455 butter fat and I think it's about 3 390 protein that's from the autumn air, but they're all over the place a little bit because there's fresh calvers coming in to keep them and and you know they're all fresh calvers really but like there's only a week or two there, and some of them they're at the most of them are only five weeks calved at max mm. like so okay. yeah, yeah so they're not at peak yet yeah. like so yeah. not at yeah. peak and you just yeah. want to keep them healthy at this stage short as well like I mean there's not there would be no issues really there Aiden with um displacements or issues like that we'll come to it now in a second on the on the on the on the dry cow thing but I suppose look we want to just get them settled in and then when they get in on the diet you're looking at probably feeding them for sort of 31 32 kilos when they when they settle in so we'll, we'll come to that sure. in a second okay so look um I suppose look at management plan I suppose 55 60 60 days dry I suppose there thereabouts we want them calving a tree at body condition score a tree which is a bit of a challenge on the on the autumn calvers, given that the late lactation diet for an autumn calver essentially is June, July grass or August grass, so it is a it is a challenge maybe to keep the condition uh, tight on cows actually compared to maybe a lot of cases in spring herds maybe where you're facing into low DMD silage for the winter and maybe cows maybe thin at drying off. Generally speaking, it's to hold the condition is what we're trying to do. So. Um, we Aiden would graze the the dry cows would graze after the milking cows. I should I should say maybe for for this you know really nailing down the 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 um the post grazing residuals in the in the in in that sort of August September period or until about three weeks pre calve and we're not that worried about gut fill at all in our dry cows uh, at that stage of the year at that stage they're eating probably seven eight kilos dry matter maybe of residual grass essentially. And then from then, from sort of two to three weeks pre-calf, and then we would move them then sort of three weeks to be safe onto our transition diet, which is not too fancy or not too um, not too high tech, but it does work. Like it's basically four or five kilos of a standing stand hay, basically, or four or five kilos of a, of a strip grazed low, low fertilizer grass. So I didn't get much fertilizer for a couple of, for a couple of rounds pre, prior to going in on this. So it's built up as a heavy cover. We'll see it in a second. They get haylage to appetite in a, in a round feeder, essentially. They're all, they're fed outside. Then they get their, they get a kilo of barley or thereabouts with, with their standard mineral supplement in it, high mag mineral supplement, they would have been getting buckets in the field up to that point for trace minerals. And then we do have the option, which we've used some years with just putting extra mag in mag chloride through the water if, if needed, um, just to push them on, depending on the year. So look at the majority of them calve for that system, they calve outdoors unassisted. Um, and it's just a case of strip. You can see that's our sort of calf and paddock there. Um, you can see what type of residuals are, are, are left behind. This is, they're only in there for, as I said, for a couple of weeks pre-calving. They're getting their low potassium forage, keeps the weight off them, I suppose, too, because it's hay and they're strip grazing, as you can see, as you can see there um, in, the, in the background. 
So that's the idea. And look, that cow in front here, I suppose, is close to really what we'd like for, for body condition at calf and down. You know, plenty, a decent cover on her, but ribs still showing and not too full in the, not too full across the tail head either. And that would be the general, the general run of things. So it's quite low, it's quite low labor, really, Stuart, that there's no bedding and no messing like that. Or the, yeah. the calf, calves are very healthy when the calf out like that. And look at, in the good conditions in September, uh, and you've got a good block, you know, when you've got a high six week calving rate, you get a lot of cows calved in decent weather. Obviously, as the tail end comes in and weather changes, we do have to bring them, you know, they'll be brought in and calved indoors if the, if the weather is poor. But that seems to, to work uh, very well. We'll bring it in on now in a second. So look at overall, you know, 11 kilos dry matter intake roughly. They're getting their eight, eight and a half units of energy, which is enough to gain a little bit of condition, but not too much. They're their diet overall would be sort of 12% crude protein, which is fine for, for a dry cow. There'd be no real issues with colostrum quality. Um, or the MG there is magnesium. We're looking for sort of 0.4% mag. So that's 25 grams of supplemented uh, magnesium to, for milk fever purposes and try and keep the potassium as low as we as we can in the diet as well for, for sort of milk fever, for, for milk fever reasons. So that's where, the, that's where the calf, you know, that's our sort of standing haylage there, if you like. So they get a strip of that every day plus the hail, or so that's your standing, standing grass for, that puts a bit of protein and a bit of quality into the diet. The haylage does out the, the, the minerals and then they're getting their obviously they're getting their supplementary minerals as well so it's quite sort of low tech but seems to seems to work fairly fairly well any comments on that Aidan in terms of management of that or what way are we um how do you how's that working in 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 general for dry cows yeah no like like you said it's it, it's sort of no frills it's 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 really once the weather says which it's really easy, but like nearly every year we have that seventy percent or that seventy five percent of the, the cows out on the on the on the calving paddock, uh, it, just as you outlined there. Um, the, the other the other twenty or twenty five percent then sort of towards the, the, the weather is sort of after breaking a bit, and they're they're calved generally calved indoors. What we, we are at the moment there this week now, we just sort of that we have still some grass left in the calving paddock, so we're grazing, letting them out by day, and just turn them into a house by night. We didn't really have that option up until this year. We have a sort of a, a better calving shed facility that we can sort of turn in a group of cows there now. But up until that, it was very much out in the calving paddock, regardless of the weather. Sort of this year, yeah. and if the weather break a bit, we, we have the option just to turn them in for the night the way they want to turn, turn up the paddock. Right? But yeah. work really well. Um, you just, I think, yeah, generally anybody will say the autumn cows they tend to be fitter, right? but they just fire out the calves a lot quicker. Now, this year we went through well, there we had actually. Uh, five, we had to assist five cows in the space of 10 days um, and all, all calves coming backwards. We didn't know what way. We were blaming the AI man or something. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> Put them in back. It's the <laughs> wrong way going into the gun. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and we wouldn't have had, you know, but just, just pure freak. Like, um, but other than that, um, very virtually no assists or anything like that. So... Um, in, in, term, yeah. in terms of observation, then, Aidan, is it, um, are they close to, to hand to the unit that you can see them on an ongoing basis at that stage? Or, or what yeah, is it? yeah, it's it's the paddock closest to the I suppose closest to the shed, and, and we are sort of that's the one we use sort of nearly every year. Um, and and uh, like on the road where we're driving up and down the whole time, and what we do then, like Joe would have said, when we. The reason when we're feeding out the minerals, we're, it's true, is sort of about a kilo of a sort of just a, a coarse ration, just the minerals mixed in it um, in the evening because there's no one here at night. Right? And so generally I'll throw that out to them there be, uh, sort of around five o'clock before five o'clock and you'll check them then. You can sort of get a hand on the pins. Right? And then if you think they're going to calf, somebody will probably come back to to check them there at some stage during the night. And if there's nothing on, then they'll know when they'll be back. So it's it's a long time between five o'clock, like a normal commercial farm, maybe they'll someone will have a look at them before they go to bed or anything like but here it's sort of someone will come back or if not there's nothing happening it's sort of next morning seven o'clock then or whatever so mm -hmm. yeah so just to, just to make the point too Stuart it's important there that like as you can see from the from that paddock it's not a bear paddock they're on yeah yeah you know, which would I be an important point from the K point of view wouldn't yeah it? I think sometimes those, those low um those fresh little regrowths are very high in K. yeah Exactly. So I think sometimes you do see it on a lot of farms and where maybe they're out on a bear paddock and there's regrowths coming back, you know, and that's that's very high cave stuff. So that can be a real problem. So it really is just kind of that that paddock is very heavy cover, as you can see. It's stripping through that, uh, fencing them off the 
fencing them off the, the the residuals basically and keep making sure that it's 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 a stand in hay essentially rather than a bare paddock and that is important to sort of point out i think um calving outside can go very wrong if the if the if you're eating lush green grass like you know you'd often see that for fellas in the spring even where they might turn be behind and they turn out turn out yeah. to later calvers and it can be a bit of a nightmare so it's not it might, you know, there's 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 a lot of science behind what you're looking at in that picture. So, <laughs> uh, believe it or not. so no, it is it is important just to to make sure that you know I wouldn't like people to sort of decide to put cows out to calve them outside and and um, and run into a lot of problems. So it, yeah. just to be just to be clear on that and look at maybe just to highlight that. Look at this is our mineral composition. You know, just in our silage, you can see on the left hand side here. Not to go into too much detail, but the potassium in some of the stemmier stuff that we would have for the spring herd is at 2.2, 2.3 percent potassium. It would want to be that low anyway, even slightly. High, you know, that's on the more on the borderline. Mm -hmm. But you look here on some of the stuff that was taken off surplus paddocks or very you know may surplus silage if you like in bales that's up at three percent potassium so like if you fed that silage on the right to dry cows you could be running into trouble with magnesium and milk fever the one on the left hand side is relatively low risk i suppose so just to be clear that the mineral content particularly the potassium uh, would be important to, to keep an eye on so you know left hand side sort of that's more like your sort of stemmy or 68 dnd silage suitable for a dry cow stuff on the right you know high high digestibility cut in may very high in decay levels you know anything over two point sort of two and 2.4 percent you would have to begin it to keep an eye on it so just to just to be to clear that point and certainly if you were grazing lush swords with dry cows they're probably eating something like what's on the right uh, we wouldn't be wouldn't be um suggesting that, that should be done at all okay just okay. that we're, <clears throat> we're clear on that okay yeah so, so just, look at, on, just before you move on to the indoor feeding joe the um the residuals on the paddock there that the cow the cows are grazing mm. at that stage like what obviously where they're feeding the haylage is going to be maybe soiled a bit so they're not going to clean it out but you make them skin it or what way do you work it like and we'll say how do you actually put that cover there then there's out that's as you yeah, said there's, yeah. there's a bit of science behind it obviously and you make a decision at some point in time that you have to stop that field in order to get it to where you want it to be for for september like or for the actually for sure probably from mid-august really is it yeah, yeah, I know. Even even earlier, um, like it's 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 probably from about the, it could be even the from oftentimes when we start drying drying off, uh, Stuart. So when we 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 leave it closed, like so, ideally sort of six or eight weeks. I, the rougher, the better, really, uh, is the easiest way of starting to saying it. Now, even actually, because what you were saying about the <laughs> you were, I was laughing there about the residuals. You normally get a sort of a a, a sort of a, a damp week or something where the residuals are ones we're not doing. Uh, once we're in compliance and we're not doing any damage we move the feeder regularly and also it's just it, oftentimes it can be a bit brown and off we, we, we would shake some grass seed on it sort of around now on any of the brown areas so actually at the moment the, the grass quality is probably nearly a bit too good even if you leave it for a few weeks there was some clover in one of the mixes that we shouldn't really probably use really like ideally just sort of a stemmy hay is what we want so yeah. we want to like if it's grown for eight weeks it's fine we, we can afford to we, we plan that out and, and just leave it and then yeah. the result push them hard, like actually we're feeding a sort of a hay this year. We didn't have any haylage and then um, they, they like the hay. They're not even cleaning out as, as, as well as we'd like on, on the boat. But if you leave them hard enough, like just, just leave nothing behind you. But like we were saying, uh, you're back fencing then. So you're given a chance to recover. It's amazing. The same as any marking that you'll do out in a grazing paddock. It's amazing once you take stock off and how green the grass can recover um, quick enough as well. So yeah. yeah. So but and just rem just to remember, sure, they're not on that for the entirety of their dry period. Like they are. Oh yeah. Okay. Cover. So it's really only yeah. a couple of weeks, and they're they're rolling in and out of that paddock. So it's not like there's a whole there's a whole eight weeks per cow on that kind. They're really only on that for sort of fifteen to fifteen days, twenty days maybe on average uh, per cow is okay. all the all there would be. And look at again, even on the heifers like you know, your first calf heifers are a low milk fever risk anyway, so they're in there, but it's not, you know, they're not, they don't have to be in there for as long maybe as even the, the mature cows would be. So that's just to point that out too. Look, okay. we'll move on uh, to the to the indoor feeding thing just because um, we need to keep moving, I suppose. Uh, yeah, so look, I suppose the, the first thing we're going to say on the indoor feeding thing, of course, like we, we have to say this, that really at this stage, you know, the the 
you know, the bullet is in the gun at this stage as far as the equality goes. Um, so you know, it's really and all, Joe. <laughs> yeah. So what are we going to do? Like, you know, silage yeah. quality is really obviously going to dictate um, what we do for the for the winter. And you know, I do hear some lads saying sometimes, you know, that, that you know, particularly maybe on particularly heavy farms or wet farms where there is a concern and a legitimate concern to have enough silage for the winter, never mind quality. You know, uh, if you're going to be serious about winter milk, obviously you're going to need um, you're going to need decent quality, decent quality silage. And to be fair, and you can see that through the silage competitions at different parts of the country over the years, there are some people out there that are just experts at making silage. They make very, very good silage and they seem to do it every single year. They have a recipe which involves reseeded swords good soil fertility and cutting at the right time and they get what they need in the pit and then you've got it's the same people every year and like there's no point in t telling them what to do because they know they know what to do already it's the people in the middle maybe that just need to push silage quality that little bit now look at there is um you know the average silage quality obviously in the country is about 66 67 dmd on maybe winter milk farms would be slightly higher but we would like to see it sort of certainly into the into the mid 70s i suppose which was really kind of your sort of mid may cut with plenty of leaf in it if there's stem or seed head in it you're probably gone a little bit too late so look all the talk about balance and diets and all the rest of it really the reality is that if you're talking about you know, silage that's sort of less than 70, certainly DMD or less than, certainly less than anything less than 70, it becomes very, very difficult to do much with, 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 um, with concentrates to balance that up. Because, you know, even if you look at it on paper, um, if you get the same level of, of sort of UFL and protein on paper, if you, if you, if the, if there's, if the forage portion of the diet is higher, um, and the, the, a lot of that quality is coming from the forage. The diet will feed out better than a, than a similar diet on paper that's made up of meal. It's just remember, it's a room and you're feeding, I suppose, and that's that's the reason why. So look at that's the first point. It's really silage testing is the thing, and looking at at this stage, you're almost looking at it as a way of deciding: should I do a better job next year on my silage, or did I do a good job this year? And then you you balance from you balance from there. Now look, this is um pit silage from 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 ourselves for for this year look at it's at 73 dmd we probably would like it maybe um a couple of points higher than that but protein percent for ourselves is about 14 and a half uh, which is decent enough dry matters at 34 percent. so it is a dry silage it's well preserved you can see the ph is good the ammonia is good it's re well preserved and um, the fiber levels aren't too, too high and the PDIN and PDIE, which are the values of protein, basically, we look at that in a while, and um, they're pretty good as well. So look, we'd like a couple of extra points maybe on, on digestibility, but I think based on the on the dry matters and the preservation of it, that silage we would expect to feed out relatively well, and it sets us off in a good in a good place to um to start building the the diet overall. Just one figure maybe to draw your attention to, sure, this feed into milk intake figure here, which is calculated as sort of the intake potential of the silage uh, on, on low levels of supplement, so less than two kilos of supplement. For anyone looking, if they want to sort of give an idea, if you divide that figure roughly by eight, it'll give you what the what the silage intake will be for a sort of 600, 620 kilo cow. So in this case, uh, dividing that by eight, we're talking about that the silage is an intake potential of somewhere around 14 kilos dry matter, which would be decent. A poorer quality silage with high fiber or poorly preserved might only have an intake value of 11 kilos dry matter. Matter. So straight away you're into three kilos more supplement to to get to the same point. So on that on the on the on the analysis that's coming there through an accredited through an accredited lab, it must be said as well that it's it's a, it's a, it's a, an accredited test. Uh, you're talking something around six and a, six point nine seven kilos for a sort of a twenty seven liter uh, for seven twenty seven liter feeding rate or thereabouts. So we'd be relatively happy. We'd probably like a little bit more in digestibility, but. Um, but I think it'll feed out pretty pretty decent. Aidan, just on that, that's on, on our first cut pit side. Is there any comments in terms of, you know, when it was made, when it was closed, what it got? Um, not just in summary, like what what was the what was the basis of making that of that side? Is that's your your first cut pit stuff? Yeah, our, our first cut pit stuff. Um, it was it was cut. It was made the fourteenth of May. So I I again I was disappointed. I seem to be disappointed every year. Like I, I think you're. I, in that in that middle class that you were talking about, Joe, like cause we we seem to consistently, our target is always seventy five. 
we seem to consistently hit sort of 73, 74, or maybe 75 a good year, you know, that, um, and we, we're cutting, our target every year is to cut sort of mid, mid-May. mid If you have a target to cut the 20th of May and the weather is bad, it, it, it could end up rolling out to the towards the end of May. So our target sort of any time from 10th, 15th of May, that's our target. If it rolls to the 20th, it's not a disaster at neither, depending on the weather. Um, would have been closed for at, at least six weeks, I suppose, really. Um, a good portion of it would have been grazed. Um, we're not concerned because we need to take a, a, a second cut for nearly all of it again uh, on the autumn system. We need good quality silage on both first and second cuts. If the, we're not concerned about really the yield, if it's, if it's, if it's fit to cut, we'll cut it. And if there's only four, four and a half ton on the, even in the first cut, we'll get four, four and a half ton in the second cut. If you take a cut of five or six ton in the first cut, it'll be slower recovering and you'll, you just, you'll lose at the second cut. So not really concerned too much. If it's That's what, dry matter per, that's dry matter per hectare, Aidan, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. it's quality we're chasing and probably where we're falling down a bit, maybe there's a portion of what our outblock is, are, is in that pit as well. And some of it probably needs to be receded. It's sort of probably 10 years and cutting silage every year. So, that might be bringing down the, the well, that's what we'll make. points, yeah. 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 And then, look at, yeah. it wouldn't have been, um, I, I, we would, we'd be going on in, in late January, early February or whatever with the first application. So it'd be split applications, probably getting less than 100 kgs then in total anyway, before first cut, uh, depending on slurry and everything. So there'd be a mix there. It's just, uh, but it, yeah. you know, yeah. So I'd say, look at in summary, sure, not to, to get onto the actual composition of the diet, I suppose the tweaking we probably need is, a bit more detail on the on the out block, which probably needs to be cut without being grazed in the spring. Uh, cut that few days earlier, sure. yeah. uh, and that would be that would be it. But I still think that'll feed out. You know, that'll still feed out relatively well. It's seventy three DMD. It's dry, well preserved, good protein levels in it. Um, it'll still it'll still do a job for us. And it's you know we're basically if you want to look at the diet now, just what that how that'll fit into the diet, we'd be feeding nine kilos Joy. dry. Sorry, Joy. It's typical of the silage that we've made for the last four or five yeah, years. And yeah. like in fairness, we're happy with the way it's sort of feeding out. Like well, yeah. sure, you'll go through the that we've been using. So like it's it's um it probably it maybe it'll feed out a little bit better even than a test. Like we'll be testing it as we feed out during the year so and sometimes you yeah. will come up that like it will I think it'll, it'll it it generally does feed well in and we're never we're never that con, you know the, the performance is relatively relatively good or relatively on target. So look at Stuart, yeah the so this will be our sort of standard diet. Now look at the proportions of maize and silage and grass silage would de- vary depending on the system. But gen our general run of things over the last few years has been kind of two thirds grass silage, one third maize silage. So the maize silage is uh, would be over 30 for dry matter and for starch. So good quality maize silage brought into the diet, um, nine kilos. So you're talking about 13 and a half to 14 kilos of forage intake, which is important. Then they're getting three kilos of a, of a, of a high protein blend uh, through, the, through the forage, which is basically a blend of barley, beet pulp, soya and distillers. So a cereal, a pulp, a soya, and then an intermediate or a, you know, a, a secondary protein um, source plus minerals, they're getting three kilos of that. So that's your nine and four and a half and then your three kilos of blend uh, is what is the sort of basic diet. They're all getting a ki- they're all getting a couple of kilos in the parlor at least. And then depending on whether it's say low yielders or higher yielders, up to maybe seven kilos in the parlor roughly. So your your higher yielders could get you know, your higher yielding cows could be sort of sitting on around something and three kilos to something around eight kilos, eight and a half kilos of ration in total plus the forage. That's roughly where we're we're at. So the the it's a high energy concentrate in the in the um in the parlor as well. And that's obviously mineralized too. So you're covered for calcium, phosphorus, for there's a bit of salt in there, plus your trace minerals. So really what we're saying there is that if you take your 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 forage plus your blend plus your basic kilo or kilo and a half of concentrate in the parlor, that's covering you for about something in the region of 20 kilos of milk and then you, you sort of top up the higher yielders up to 30 kilos with the additional concentrate which they'll eat easily in terms of the total diet what that looks like on paper then total dry matter is about 36 uh, percent which is good for a good level for for getting good intakes our energy levels 0.95 for ufls and that's for the total diet which would be pretty pretty decent our crude protein levels are sort of 15 and a half to 15 and a half to 16 maybe closer to 15 and a half uh, generally so we're not pushing for 
using very high crude protein ingredients uh, for the sake of it. We're really looking for high energy ingredients with a good protein profile. The PDIN and the PDIE there are two measures of protein. So the PDIN is basically the amount of protein that the cow digest or absorbs basically based on the amount of nitrogen in her diet. And the PDIE is the amount of protein she absorbs, which is based on the amount of energy in her diet. So basically what you've got there is nitrogen and energy working together and they're quite closely balanced. Uh, they're quite closely balanced overall. So really what that's saying is we're not wasting crude protein and we're not wasting energy really. And when we do them sums, generally speaking, we should be able to balance the diet at sort of 15 and a half crude protein overall rather than we used to be up at 17 and a half and 18 percent which was really kind of just waste in nitrogen and was reducing our and our nitrogen efficiency as well so we're happy enough that that diet will perform pretty decent our solids percentages over last winter they kind of did 348 protein as fresh cows thereabouts 420 fat uh, and something in and around the 30 31 kilos of milk that's what that diet was returning which we're, we're relatively happy with um starch and sugar we'll just run through them and come to the questions in a second starch and sugar together if you add those two together if it's under 20 percent there's not a huge risk of acidosis so you can see there you're in and around the 20 percent in combined starch and sugar and we're happy enough that that's not a very risky diet or a very a very hot diet in terms of acidosis risk and then our fiber which we'll come to maybe in more detail in a second um, we're looking at fiber in two ways i suppose the neutral detergent fiber which is kind of really dictates your intake that's kind of a measure of total fiber and including what's digestible in that 35 36 percent is very very safe and um, you could drop that down to 30 percent easily and for very high performing herds but you know based on that level and then the adf then is really the more indigestible part of the fiber if you like it's once that's over 20 percent you don't really have much issue with, with acidosis so based on that like there's no there's no need for any ad additional fiber to be added we're happy enough that if we're getting them intakes of forage if we feed the concentrate as we feed it there's some pulp in there as well we're not worried at all about fiber fractions and i think maybe Aidan might comment on that in terms of digestive upsets or issues like that feeding up to seven kilos in the parlor plus three outside for the very higher yielding cows We've had no real issue with 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 acidosis or or um, digestive problems once they're settled um, settled on that diet. Just any comment on that, Aidan, in terms of managing in the winter time? Are we are we happy enough that cows are are eating that and not not up, there's no real upsets in terms of um, in terms of um, digestive? No, weight? no um, yeah, very happy. Yeah, um, it's just. Uh, terms of digestive upsets we've we haven't had a i i don't think i i we had an lda or a displaced abmezzi either at both the autumn or the spring herd it's thing for the past and come across in really since the last 10 or 12 years really like to be very set that way the odd ketotic cow maybe but it might be more something else really that's causing it really sort of if she's sort of um dirty after calving or something maybe but very yeah. little it just settled then and then um like I suppose maybe going back to when we were feeding that sort of the other the sort of the traffic goal those sort of things were, were a trickier diet like it's a very simple diet and once the silage quality is good I think it's like you were saying before it's easier it's easy enough to make it up the refusals then like there's there's very if there's no bad silage going in or there's no refusals they're licking it clean and just mm. in terms it, I don't know whether it's a uh, Definitely over the last few years, I suppose we pulled the protein back and I, I think the cows are, maybe it's just the type of cows that improved from an EBI that they're holding condition, but we're definitely, we're not pushing maybe our peak milk yield, or like what you were saying earlier, isn't peaking quite as high, but they're, they're holding a flatter um, yield and they seem to be holding condition better even when we're breathing and all. So maybe it's more the cow than the, the diet, I'm not sure. Maybe you'd have a comment on that, Joe, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think look at the, where we're at at the protein there, Aidan, is really that we've taken the real, we've taken the surplus or the excess protein out of the diet essentially, uh, but we probably haven't dropped the protein so far that it would actually impact hugely on milk yield uh, at all. So probably a little bit of saving in nitrogen efficiency. I think the cow, as you say, the the breeding for fertility sub index and maintenance sub index, particularly the fertility sub index, makes it easier to for the cow makes it easier to keep condition on cows. And it's, it's a thing I've come across many times over the years where people are breeding heavily for cows that are designed to lose weight. And then they're ringing, looking for people to design diets for them to keep the weight on them. 
which doesn't make a lot of sense. It's very hard to very hard to make up a diet to um, to keep condition on a cow that's, that doesn't drive milk. That, that actually just wants to milk yeah. genetically wants to milk off her back essentially. So look at what that diet does, Stuart, is really turns us out that sort of thirty to 32 kilos of milk, depending on the silage quality and depending on the year, in and around that, 30, in around 31 kilos on average. Uh, and then you're talking, um, the solids will stay, you know, you keep the protein north to 345 in the fresh cows and keep the fat north to 410. We're happy, we're happy enough for that part of the season. We can, we can certainly make gains then when we get them to grass. But I think it's a, it's a relatively simple, um, a rel- relatively simple targets. Keep the energy up. Don't overdo the protein. Uh, and the real challenge really for a lot of people, I think, and for ourselves included, is to get the fiber fraction down in the diet rather than trying to put the fiber up because we're, it's to try and get the cows to eat a little bit more is the problem. And that NDF fiber figure is something that really does dictate um, it does dictate intake. So look, at, we would work on the basis that sort of 230 times the peak would roughly be what we'll produce for the year. So like if we get the cows to sort of the 32 liter mark, they'll probably end up doing seven and a half thousand or thereabouts for the year and I think given you know where we're at in the type of system we're running I think we're relatively we're relatively happy that that's an efficient uh, an efficient diet uh, to, to run with so look at it does make it easier and it's back to that point and we'll come to maybe in a second it does make it easier that if you look at our calving pattern like the 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 stale springs cows or the, those cows are well done and they're they're well finished in terms of their milk yield by the time you get into early mid-December so really that when you when you sort of get to the 10th of december it's really the spring herd is essentially finished and what you're doing then is concentrating on feeding the fresh calvers very very well through christmas and on into the new year do you get me it's not like we're yeah. trying to you're doing your not, blocks of work all the time yeah right? you're not yeah. doing your you know your stragglers i think sometimes is the big problem on a lot of herds where you have this cow that calves in may and june and she's going into the shed doing 18 or 20 liters and still good milk yield but um, does she end up getting fed for 30 kilos then and maybe getting over conditioned or maybe just inefficient use of feed so it is important that it's 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 nice to be able to say right here's my fresh calvers they're after doing their you know they're after, they're in a while now and we sort of set them up and try and feed them as well as we can and we're not sort of the thing isn't complicated by having sort of rollover cows or stragglers that are inefficient in terms of their ability to produce milk um at that time of the at that time of the year you know so yeah. look so that so just yeah, two sorry. questions here so Joe, um the protein content or content of the the blend what is, what that work oh sorry out? yeah look that that will work out at about that will work out at about 23 percent right that'll work out 23 percent protein um overall and then 18 on the other one but it's 23 percent protein based on good ingredients you know it's not made up of by it's not made up of high protein byproducts with low energy it'd be very it'd be very um it'd be decent so it's basically more or less what it is it's a quarter it's pretty much, if you want to look at it, it's a four-way mix or close to it of of the four ingredients with the minerals, uh, with the minerals included as well. There, thereabouts. Okay. We would we would adjust that though, mm. depending if, yeah. if if quality wasn't as good, maybe yeah. Yeah. It, you know, or depending on what way. So that when when we know the the maize, the analysis of the maize and the, the silage, we yeah, can adjust essentially, yeah. it yeah. only it only tweaking that way it really is now. That's it. So we tweak, we tweak there maybe more so than on the protein. Essentially, we can up or down the soy and distillers relative to the barley and bee pulp, and that'll change our, fra- our protein fraction in the diet, uh, in the diet overall. But it's a, you know, if you've set that up in that way, it's a good diet. If you said that your your forage in that blend plus a kilo or so in the parlor for your state, your your lower yield or cows, that's a good diet for the for for them. If you feed that diet plus six kilos in the parlor, it's still a very it's still a relatively well balanced diet for the for the for the higher yielding cows because the eighteen protein nut is just giving you um, a little bit of an extra quality for, for for the higher yielding cows. So that's that's where we're at, Stuart. Um, that's where we're at on that. And look at just, I, just I, before I you take the point. Just you before know, you move on again, then yeah. so Joe, like if if you didn't have the maize silage now, and Aidan's obviously kind of alluded to there a small bit yeah. that you tweak it. What would you be changing in terms of the blend? Obviously, your more grass silage going in then instead of your maize. But are you kind of compromise a small bit in terms of energy maybe that the, the maize bring a little bit more energy into it for you if you didn't have maize yeah i think the big the big challenge without the maize is the intake short is to okay. get this is to actually get into is Good. to get the still value is just too high with the silage 
yeah, but, just whatever, but, whenever you mix two forages, you're going to get an additional, you're going to, just going to get extra, um, you're going to get extra intake. Now, look at, if you were feeding 68 DMD silage and you put maize in, it would transform the diet. But if you were feeding 75 DMD silage and you put the maize in, it would improve it slightly, but not dramatically. So I think, oh, sorry. No, I think, well, it's an interesting question, but we probably don't have time now, but like we have, we have a treatment here in Johnstown that is only getting grass silage and uh, eight kilos of an 18% nut. Um, I was running last year alongside what the yeah, more yeah. you've had. Um, and where we were losing out uh, out there really was probably in the milk. Country. We're back probably about 0.15 in protein, back maybe Joe, a litre, litre and a half. Um, mm. But like provided the, the silage quality was still very good. So the, uh, I suppose the huge key then is you really have to have rock and fuel silage quality and a good nut, and then you will milk away. The cows will be fine, um, but you just you will lose a little bit, I suppose, Joel. You will, and you probably end up putting in a bit more, maybe a bit more maize grain in the mix as well, just to get a bit more starch, a high, higher energy starch source in as well, Aidan, that you'd into the into your blend. But you will, you will. It's very difficult to make up that difference. Um, sure, you'll probably lose certainly 0.1 on the on the protein probably anyway, uh, and a bit on the milk. But look at the the thing is, and in, in that case too, like for a lot of fellas maybe listening to this, they're not block autumn calving either, right? So you're probably it might only be 20 percent or 25 percent of the herd that's freshly calved in the autumn, right? Yeah. So then you're talking about 25 percent of the herd uh, milking for 100 days or 100 and, well for 120 130 days inside it becomes a relatively small proportion of the over of the annual milk yield as well you have to remember that too like how much what percentage of milk if, for anyone that's in a split calving system and maybe only has a relatively small number of autumn calvers what percentage of autumn calvers have they got like you know is it is the Will you see if there was 0.1 of a difference for a month or two? Will you see it in the annual figures? That's a question that needs to be asked as well. But essentially, if you're talking about making up the diet, the, in summary, to make up the diet differences is really have to push for very, very high quality grass silage. Probably include a bit more maize grain in the in the blends for for higher energy, and that's basically all you can. That's basically all you, you can you can do to make up the, the difference. So, you know, the ma the maize silage certainly makes a difference when your silage quality is moderate it makes less of a difference when the silage quality is excellent i think okay and just one final question then on the maize i suppose um whole crop versus maize have you any thoughts <clears throat> which is better or have you looked at it um we we, we well certainly john murphy years ago in in, in moor park would have done work on that and it was very similar work done in a lot of studies in the uk as well um the may the best may <laughs> The best maize outperformed the whole crop, but the variability in the maize crop was always the issue. Like, you know, that that maybe whole crop was more of a more of a steady thing, and that for some farms it was something that was maybe more predictable or more maybe more consistent over over years, depending on the site that you were on. But certainly, the high quality maize give probably the highest increase in in total intake and and best in, in performance. Now, look at you know yourself, Stuart, that. Um, the, the problem with a lot of whole crop is that it's it doesn't set out as whole crop in the start of the year it's you know in some cases a lot of whole crop made is in whole crop in name only like it's a it's, it could be a salvage job or it could be something anything with a bit of stuff in it at all seems to pass as whole crop at this stage uh, but a properly a proper a proper winter crop that's set out that's designed specifically to make a good crop of, of whole crop from the start it can come close to the maize i suppose but it probably depends on the site the maize is probably preferable but it doesn't work in all parts of the country that would be the main the main difference between them i i, I think you know uh, but okay. again don't don't dilute the don't dilute the uh, the message on grass silage based on the alternatives i would i would say look and um, we just move it on because i think yeah, we're getting close on time up, yeah yeah just one one thing just to make make a point on it just want, it's back to that question on fiber it is a very good measure so look at your fiber content in your diet and see is it is it, if it's over 35 percent you shouldn't be worried about adding additional fi additional fiber um lower fiber will actually reduce um it'll dry you know lower fiber uh, will Will, will actually help the cows to eat more because it's they're limited by what fiber they can eat so if you can get the fiber levels to manageable uh, it'll it'll help them to to eat more uh, the things we would be looking at to make sure we're managing the acidosis risk would be you know we're balancing our starch fraction so we're not putting in all wheat for example it's kind of putting in 
maize and barley, uh, which are more slowly digestible, uh, which is a good thing. We are putting in fiber sources like beet pulp or hulls, which are very high or good for energy, but are more slowly um, more slowly from, uh, digested. Um, obviously, feed space per cow and you know feed space per cow is very very important as well. The cows are not you know physically that they're 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 happy and they're surrounded, so there's not bullying going on. Um, and I just this is something that I, I would just include because it's something you see when you go around a lot of places where you've got sort of moderate quality silage in the you know in the in the in the feed passage, and then you've got big lumps of straw sticking out of it, um, and you're basically saying that. In a lot of cases, there's already too much fiber in the diet, and then people are adding in straw into it, which is generally might be unnecessary. You're probably adding in fiber when it's taking fiber out. You need to be doing so. Just just watch that. And one final point on that maybe is just chop length, which comes up from time to time as a, as an issue. Um, you obviously need a bit of chop length there for in order to get your um, in order to stimulate cudden and for the cows to chew their cud. But what how much long fiber is actually needed? Uh, depend on the dry matter the silage. But if you take your sort of if you take your sort of twenty two to thirty percent dry matter silage um, as a standard, really what you're talking about is kind of. The chop length of the silage should be sort of like the like the like the bottle cap there. That's the length you're talking about. Is the average chop length is the, is the width of that bottle cap and you, you don't want any more than about 10% of your particles over sort of 60 millimetres or thereabouts. So if you take a take your standard ear tag, the width of an ear tag is 55 millimetres. <clears throat> if, if you're adding in fibre and it's longer than the width of that tag, the cows are probably going to sort it out. They're probably going to leave it behind them or they're going to pick through it. So if you want to add fibre in, into a diet that needs it, it would want to be sort of chopped to you would want to be getting it down to sort of that 55 six, 55 millimeters anyway in order for the cows to not be sorting through it and picking through it because you often see that like um if you feed a stemmy bale or something the cows leave the thistles and the and the right and the, they leave the thistles and the docks behind them like so they can do that if it's too long so there's no point in adding in fiber to increase the ndf content if the cows are just going to sort through it it'll, it'll end up being left for the the, the most timid cows in the herd. So the, the bully cows will eat all the good stuff. So don't be don't be thinking that you need stuff that's as long as your arm in order to get to get the effect of, of fibre. You're really talking about uh, getting stuff that's as about the length of that tag or less, really. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah we might are we out out of time, Stuart? Okay. Yeah, I'd say we're bringing into we want to have you have you much more to no, just the, the, there's only just one other final point ahead, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one thing and oh, yeah. something we've talked it's about before. Look at, and we might just call it on this. This is just um, this is actually just a milk yield. It's a milk recording from a herd doing a, a kind of an eight thousand kilo herd done in in sort of a January recording or thereabouts, right? And what you're looking at here is the average of the herd at the time was about twenty eight kilos of milk or thereabouts. That's what they were averaging at the time. So they would have most of their they only did a few stales and mostly fresh cows milking, right? And that's what the dot, the red dot there is about the sort of the, the average. So, but you can see obviously half the cows, 50% of the cows are below average and 50% of the cows are above average. Now look at, all I want to just make the point there in that typical situation, which is very similar for a lot of herds, if you take 35 kilos and over, and we're taking that as indic indicative of high yielding cows, about 10% of the cows in the herd are over that level. And if you go over the 40 kilo mark, you're probably talking 5% percent of the herd or less are doing over the 40 kilos right so look at all i just make the point is that there's a lot of milk being produced by cows that are uh, down at this level here sort of in the low to mid 20s or whatever uh, don't allow the very high yielders that everybody talks about so much don't allow them to dictate uh the diet for every for every other cow in the herd. So you want to be feeding sort of towards a, a realistic milk yield. We would be saying they're feeding close to the average of the 28, and maybe if you have to top up a few individual cows, then 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 do so. And uh, just one, just to put that in context, I suppose, um, a, you know that very high milk from them, very highest yielding cows, is worth something between one and two percent of the daily milk yield in the herd. And uh, most of the milk actually is sold. For, for from cows doing 30, you know from 35 and under so just to put that in context what we want to do is you know when we're setting it to set up a diet you know 
we, we, we have to make sure that we get efficient production from the middle yielders and the low yielder as well, rather than just all the time talking about how do we fix the problem of the very highest yielding cows in the herd. F feed, get the good base in, and then sort out them few individuals with a bit of extra parallel concentrate if needed. That's the message uh, on that. Okay. Very, very we good. might leave it there, Stuart, because we're, we're probably busted for time. Yeah, we're just just one good question, though, Tim. Or uh, Joe, sorry, from Tim Lyons. What happens when the cows go back to grass in spring? Do you kind of wean them off the, the winter diet? So do you phase them back into the grass? Very good question. Yeah. Um, Ed, do you want to take that maybe? Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. just you know, they're you know, they're we're turning out to grass. Sort of, uh, we're adjusting. We're pulling back generally. We don't, we won't let them out unless they're getting at least four or five kilos of grass. It just wouldn't be worthwhile what we've done if we were, if we, if we were very tight in grass. Oftentimes we go out and graze for three, four or five days with good weather and then bring them back in because they're on such a good diet indoors. It doesn't unsettle the cows. They're happy to go out and they're happy to stay in either. But we'll adjust their diet. So for feed, if they're going out tomorrow, we know the weather's good to go out tomorrow. We'll adjust their diet down to probably about 80%. So, um, yeah, rather than if you're feeding for 100 cows and you still have 100 cows, you just feed for 80 cows. So you keep the, the proportions right, just drop. And generally, the, the concentrate is the last thing will drop out mm -hmm. anyway, really. So mm -hmm. if they're on 8 kilos of concentrate, it's be on 8 kilos of concentrate. We drop the forages and uh, and then they'll, we'll get very good clean out and they're back in then. And then just as we as we, the more grass comes available, we keep dropping down the, the, the diet. But... Generally, with that high stocking rate, we're nearly feeding right through most of the first round by, by night, maybe. And if we're getting out by day, it's, it's as good as we can do. But that's just from grass availability. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, there's just one other question there. The graph demonstrating the milk herd variation is excellent. It drives the message home. That's actually just a comment, I suppose, Joe. So that's, uh, that's, and that's, I'm glad I actually left you short because I, I'd said it to you earlier in the week about showing that. Not yeah. to be feeding the herd for 40 litres and there's, the average is only 28 or whatever. Yeah, and like a lot of the time, them cows, sure, as a final comment, a lot of them highest, highest yielding cows, we've measured intakes and certainly the lads in Moor Park have measured intakes on individual cows through the boxes and that over the years. And some of those individual cows on TMR systems could be eating 26, 27 kilos of dry matter. You know, so they're looking after themselves in terms of their intake capacity. So I, 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 while get the base diet good and don't don't allow them ones to drag you up because that's what happens. You end up feeding two kilos extra to everything to sort out those two or three percent in the herd. Yeah, yeah very good. So I suppose long and short of it is uh, whether it's autumn calving or spring calving, silage quality is important across all uh, stock and having the plan in place for it, like in. I think that's probably what comes across there. Aidan has a plan on how he's going to do everything there, whether dealing with the autumn herd or the spring herd. Maybe um, it sounds like maybe they're a, a lesser category in, in the, on the farm, but that's not the case. It's just we weren't focusing on, on today. So silage quality and trying to keep that NDF down to keep, keep up intakes is going to be important across all classes of stock, really, isn't it? That's it. Yeah, so that's excellent. Thanks a million, Aidan. Great to talk to you. And uh, we'll probably talk to you again in December, just in the run into your start of your breeding season again, um, just to get a rundown on how, th how you're preparing and what you're doing maybe just for, for the winter milk cards that are out there. So thanks a million for coming on this morning and thanks, Joe, as always. Uh, we'll sure. see you again next week, folks. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey, and thanks for listening.